Welcome to the realm of magic and mystery, classic horror and sci-fi. You are now entering the House of the Unusual podcast with your hosts, Eddie and Joe. Welcome to the Halloween special of House of the Unusual podcast. Your horrifying hosts this evening are Joe, Dig Your Grave Pavlansky, and Eddie, Check Under Your Bed Guevara. Tonight's spooktacular guest is Ray, the man of a thousand masks, Castile. The House of the Unusual's doors are now open. Welcome all you creaks and kooks, corpses and boogeymen. Enter, enter, join us if you dare. Hey guys, what's going on? That was our little Halloween introduction. I love it. <laughs> so this is it. This is our Halloween special, and uh, tonight we have uh, Ray Castile on. He is the, uh, we're going to call him the man of a thousand masks, because he is a, he is an expert with, uh, with masks, horror masks, and uh, well, we're going to, we'll let him do the talking and introduce himself and uh, what he's all about, what he collects, what he knows, and uh, go ahead, Ray, take it over, buddy. Hello, everyone. I'm Ray Castile. I collect Topstone masks. I've been collecting Topstone, rubber, and plastic masks for about a decade. That's my specialty. I, I collect masks in general, but I really specialize in Topstone. Now, I can appreciate Don Post and Distortions Unlimited and Be Something Studios and many other brands that are probably more mainstream in the mask collecting community, but I really gravitate to Topstone masks because th- those are the cheap, flimsy masks that you saw at the drugstore or Kresge every Halloween. They'd be in a wire bin, just all piled on top of each other. Also in the mail order ads, particularly like Warren Magazine's Famous Monsters in the late 50s through 60s, and in comic books as well, you would see Top Stone masks advertised in the mail order ads. So if you sent in for a shock monster, or a werewolf, or a caveman, or a gorilla, you are ordering a Topstone rubber mask. And I believe that's why I've been invited here, to give my wisdom on Topstone masks. <laughs> awesome. Well, like we were talking in, in the pre-show, I, I really enjoy the, the Ben Cooper masks. Those were the ones I, I kind of grew up w- with and... Um, you know, my first article for Scary Monsters when I, I first got on, they it was for their Halloween edition two years ago, and they wanted an article, for, you know, something to deal with Halloween, and I I really didn't know what I was going to write about, and I'm like, oh, I'm like Ben Cooper, I'm like that's, you know, my thing. I, I love those masks, so that was, you know, my my first article for any magazine was on on the Ben Cooper mask, but I, you know, aside from those, I I really like the um. You know, those cheap, flimsy, you know, uh, masks that really, you know, like you said, Ray, would you would find at a drugstore or something, you know, almost like a with the rack toys. And, yeah, you know, they just have nice designs on, on them. And the masks were, you know, the flimsy rubber, mm-hmm. the little bit of paint and, the, you know, a string or a rubber band in the back. And I, I really, really enjoy those. I was lucky enough about a year ago to uh, to grab a set of four. I, I don't know if they were top zone. There's really no um marking on them except for it said made in china but they were some really you know flimsy masks which i guess from maybe the late 50s early 60s. well if they said made in china they're not going to be from the 50s they'll be from the 90s forward because it wouldn't say made in china it would say made in hong kong okay maybe it was made in hong kong i would have to look at the uh the packages again i know it was somewhere over there and they're very brittle the the plastic is you know kind of you know cracking and all that on the uh the outer wrap and everything. So maybe I'd have to look, maybe it did say Hong Kong or something, but I, I know they're definitely old, not from the nineties, but you know, definitely, you know, sixties or seventies. Well, let me put a little inside here of who Ray Castile has been since I've known him. I met Ray. Well, I met you Ray, I guess back in universal monster army yeah. way back many years ago. Um, Ray actually, talking with him after he assisted me in how to do and post in Universal Monster Army. Uh, one time he helped me 
remember what the instructions of the vampire bat, the one that was very famously sold with the monster goes by the Melton company. And since Ray, you had ordered one. I remember you actually designing for me a, the instructions, what you thought they looked like. And, you know, I was able to, because my instructions got burnt in a fire uh, way back in 1995 and you know it, it's it's been years and and i couldn't you know re, re, recollect exactly how they were you helped me in order to reproduce them and that was fantastic now the other thing that was very interesting about the whole situation is that my teen wolf mask way back when i first got it i bought it not through honor house but i bought it in woolworth and this was probably in 1973. And I had it for many years. And then I bought a second one. Uh, both, one of them, I think, was lost in the fire. The second one became a, a piece of rubber. Just like I have a whoopee cushion from the 1950s. And it's in a wooden box. The box is in beautiful. The, the artwork is great. Uh, but unfortunately, due to the fact that the whoopee cushion inside... It's just a lump of rubber. Mm -hmm. It you can't even open it. It's it's impossible. But anyway, the box is still nostalgic and it's an original. So you know it's there in my collection. Now, uh, real quick, I, I I just sent you guys. I don't know if you're able to pull it up a picture that those masks they they were from uh made in Hong Kong on them. So I don't know if you're able to see them. Where I have no where would I look to see them? I'm in the. I sent I sent them. Oh on yeah. The so I I have this set myself. This I have a package set of these yeah i don't the only one i couldn't find is the one with all the different there's one with a bunch of different eyes on it or different faces three faces one in the front and one to the left and yeah, right i'm not sure if i have that one yeah. either those are definitely not top no stone, they're not top stone. yeah not top stone, no. no but they're but those are the kind of like the ones i was talking about they're real you know not very nice artwork you know on the mm -hmm. packaging and you know they're just kind of like cheap cool masks but i you know, definitely not top stone, you know, probably I, less quality than top no, yeah. stone. Actually, the, the no, I was going to say the one to the left in the bottom looks a little bit like Todd. Maybe the, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, those are definitely, those are like kind of um, <laughs> joke store novelty type rack toys, those masks that you just showed. Uh, top stone okay. is definitely a Halloween mask company. That was their big time of year and, and their mask products were all aimed at the Halloween season, things you would buy for Halloween. So, and, and they're pla they made a lot of different plastic masks like that. Uh, and the, now, now, didn't Top Stone? Did they? Didn't they make like a um, like a caveman? Yeah, type a mask very, or something very like famous that? caveman. If you see, oh, like on TV shows in the fifties, early sixties, whenever they had someone wearing a caveman mask, it was always a Top Stone mask. That was okay. the very famous. Uh, it was it was it was designed by Keith Ward, who owned Top Stone in the early days. And if you see an ad, uh, it has the uh, like a comic book ad that has the caveman and the gorilla together, the two faces. Okay, that's a yeah. Top Stone Keith Ward caveman, and, and the mask looks pretty much like that illustration. It, it's a pretty accurate illustration. So any any okay. whenever you see an old caveman. Or an old gorilla mask in an old movie or an old TV show, chances are you're looking at a Top Stone caveman or gorilla. There were also copycats. There were other companies that copied Top Stone's designs, but the iconic one, was, the iconic caveman of the 50s and 60s is the, the uh, Top Stone caveman. Okay. Now, now are, are the Top Stone masks, are they pretty easy to find no. or are they, they rare? Oh, originals. See, there, there's, there's modern ones. The, the masters for most of the masks were uncovered about 20 years ago. Uh, a man in the Connecticut area found oh, a storage room in an old building uh, that just, no one really knows what they were doing there. It wasn't a top stone building. It's kind of a mystery of how they got there, but there was a room uh, in the upper story and the new owners of the building found all these masters, these mask masters, and didn't know what they were, and they and they put a a notice out in like um, discussion group saying, "Hey, we just found all these masks. These uh, masks. We're not sure what they are. Is anyone interested?" And this one individual, his name's George. 
he he discovered oh, he he was the one who had the foresight to to respond to them and say yeah i'll come take a look and he he discovered them and recognized them for what they were and he loaded up his pickup truck with all these dozens of masters <laughs> and drove away <laughs> and the, the the, that's amazing how people just yeah come and, into and, stuff and the like owners the owners of the building are just happy to get rid of them and i'm telling you one, one day eddie you are going to be going through a warehouse somewhere and you're going to come across that that robot that mm-hmm. you wanted man. And, so 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 today you can find newly made top stone masks they're they're thick they're made for collectors they're they're if they're painted they're usually painted very well and they come from those masters that were discovered 20 years ago. So, but those are modern. Those, those that latex was poured in the last 20 years, and they were they were made by collectors for collectors. So, but the original vintage topstone masks made by the topstone company in the 50s through the early 90s. Um, the later, and you know that. And you know that that's some good information for collectors too to to be aware when they're when they're buying is to make sure you know if you're looking for an original or you're looking for a new one to to know you know what you're looking for because there are those mm-hmm. reproductions. And out you know there. the reproductions are very desirable. And there's some people who just collect the reproductions. They don't want the originals because the reproductions look sharp. They they look more professionally painted and they they just have a more contemporary sharper image. And they don't really, the, some collectors don't really have a taste for that cheesy, you know, thin rubber, sloppy paint look of the old ones. So they're... See, I'll take the cheesy yeah. all day. <laughs> but, but, you know, some of those, those modern ones, they're, they're never cheap. Because even if you buy them direct from the person who has the molds, still there's all their labor to, to, they have to make the mold, they have to pour the latex, they have to paint. There's all kinds of labor involved. So you're still going to spend between a hundred and two hundred dollars even if you're buying it direct from the person who has the mold and if it changes hands a few times and if the mold owner or their, or their master the owner of the master isn't making them anymore it can get up into the five or six hundred dollar range for some of those yeah oh, wow. so these are the modern ones now the old ones the early 50s 60s 70s keith ward designs the, like the classic iconic designs, those are very rare. Uh, I'm sure I, by far I've got the biggest collection of those in the world, I have no doubt. And some of the ones I have are the only known example, or in some cases there's three or four examples that are known to exist. So what, what, would, be the, what would be the most rare? Uh, the well, the horrible melting man is pretty rare, and I've got the only one anyone knows about. Um... Let's see. The Shock Monster, even though he's a very iconic, very famous character, he's one of the most famous masks ever made. There are only maybe four surviving examples. Um, there's two blue-haired examples, one white hair and one black hair example. And I've got the white hair and one of the blue-haired ones. So no one knows where the black haired one is. It kind of got lost into the collecting community. No one knows who has it or if it's still around. Um, someone f- discovered a, another blue haired one. Oh, just like a year ago. It actually was in a, like a thrift store or a, or a Goodwill or something like that. It was, it was like in the most unlikely place. And it was a big discovery. Uh, it, it's the, it's kind of trimmed Like the eye holes are trimmed wide. So it's not, it's not an ideal example because you want that eyeball sticking out. But still, it's the only, besides the one I've got, it's the only other blue-haired shock monster anyone knows about. So there's only four existing legitimate Keith Ward shock monsters as far as anyone knows. I'm sure there are others out there and they'll surface. Who knows? Maybe there's a pallet full of them <laughs> in shipping boxes somewhere. You yeah. know, we don't know. But, well, but the thing nice. is, they're made of, <laughs> like that rubber doesn't last forever it deteriorates so you know the clock's ticking on those things if they're out there in warehouses somewhere they're not necessarily going to survive years and years until someone finally finds them they, by the time they're found it might be like eddie was saying clumps of rubber uh you know yeah no i was going to say you know with the uh when you're talking about the different mask and and all that i was about to just ask you but you brought it up the shock monster 
uh, which some claim is like such the greatest mascara. But then I forgot what you mentioned, the Melting Man, which now, of course, to mail order people, the Teen Wolf and the Shock Monster would be more prevalent or more wanted or sought after uh, because they remind themselves of the comic book ads. Now, what I wanted to ask you, Ray, one time I gave you a while back one of my original top stones. It was a Wolfman. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that mask? Yeah, was... so I remember that. I've got a few of those. That that so apparently, according to, at some point they stopped shipping the Teenage Werewolf, the Keith Ward Teenage Werewolf, and they started shipping that one, the one that you're talking about. If you if you mailed in, no, actually, yeah, that that is also yes, the one that they started shipping. Is kind of like a cheaper version, half face. No, but there was another one I sent you in a poly bag. I think it said Wolfman on it, and it was kind of like orangey. Do you uh, remember that one? No, I don't remember that one. I remember that you told me I have one already. I sent it to you. I said, take it anyway. Okay. I don't... And you said, I have um, one already. You forgot that one? No, I don't remember that one. It's a top stone. Okay, it's an orange, and it's a Wolfman? No, it said Wolfman. It, it was a different Wolfman. Um, I don't know. I think I sent you one of the other ones too, the one that they sent later on. Because what happened with Honor House, the Honor House had one, not just Honor House, I think most of them did it. They would improvise. Whatever they mm-hmm. had on stock, if you had an order and they didn't have the product, they just changed it on you and sent it on you. And they were good in two ways. One is, if you remember, they used to advertise a six foot Frankenstein and yep. Dracula. But then some of the ads would say life size monsters. And it would show the Wolfman and show the face of the Wolfman, but yet it somehow deviated. It's, in other words, it made it look like it was a six-foot Wolfman or a six-foot Dracula. So it said what monster you wanted. For years, I was looking for that six-foot Wolfman because I'm like, I've never seen even a picture mm-hmm. of it. And then when I was talking with uh, uh, the, his name was the primate. Uh, uh, yeah. I forgot. He passed away. From universe. Yeah, he passed away. What was his name? Uh, I know he, the, oh, his gosh. screen name was Unknown Primate. Right, Unknown Primate. Uh, he became very good friends with me, and he actually went on to, you know, uh, draw for me, believe it or not. And I still have it. I've never put them out, but he did a six foot, a seven foot Bigfoot for me, a seven foot Shock Monster, came out awesome. And I have a seven foot, um, uh, I forgot he did something, the prisoner or. But I have about six posters that he literally drew seven mm-hmm. feet tall. And they were fantastic. I kind of didn't put him out because of the fact that he had passed away. And, you know, but I'm going to tell you one thing, though. In one of his threads, one time in Universal Monster Army, I realized he said, oh, yeah, I ordered the six foot uh, Wolfman. And this is what they sent me. And I was able to finally close the face of my book or close the page on who what the the six foot monster uh, wolfman never existed. In fact, then I realized what Honor House had done. They had used the face of that poster, which is a, a wolfman face. It's life size because it's a you know his life size yeah. face, but it's not a life size six foot poster. So then in color you know I spoke with one of the people that works with Honor House for many years. And basically, uh, that person said to me, oh, yeah, they never had it. So between the unknown primate um, and, and, you know, and that person, I was able to find out that Honor House never produced that. And I'm telling you, I spent over 10, 11 years looking for it. Um, so, the six, so that's what they did. So what they would do is when they had your... Um, they had what do you call it the 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 wolf man yeah. the team wolf when the team wolf was not available they would send and the reason I know that is because later on I sent away for it and got one of those and I'm like okay I see how they improvise the same thing the seven foot Frankenstein first started as the six foot color one and then as it just it morphed into the two piece plastic one and they never you know they still ran the same ads but it morphed into yeah that. when I was a kid I had the plastic Frankenstein and the plastic skeleton, the two piece posters. I had both of those with the glow in the dark little stickers for the eyes. I had those on my wall. So, and I also, I, my, um, I think it was my grandmother ordered the werewolf for me and I got the teenage werewolf and I, I wore it all year round. I, I, it wasn't just a Halloween thing for me. 
and and and, and it, it survived <laughs> it survived into the 90s i had it in a toy box and then sometime in the mid 90s i was looking through the toy box just looking at my old toys and just like with you eddie it was a it turned into a clump of rubber like a little man like a little baseball size mound i mean it couldn't even be unraveled so that's what happened to my childhood werewolf, but I have a, a, a rubber Topstone Teenage Werewolf today, and as we were talking before the show, as far as I know, I've got the only surviving intact intact example where did, of the rubber Teenage Werewolf. Where did you purchase it? I bought it from a collector named Dan Roebuck, who's a very well-known Oh my collector. gosh, yeah, Don, oh brother. Yes, and so... And where he got it, I, I think he got it from a well-known collector who doesn't like his name out there. Um, if, I, I think I'm not, I, I'm not sure about that, but I, I, I think that's who he got it from. My gosh! Now, now Ray, um... I haven't heard of Dan Roebuck in so many years, and I, I've dealt so many times with him. I he yeah sold yeah a lot he of did his collection, didn't he? <laughs> Yeah, that's what I thought. Now, now, Ray, um, was there any accessories that that were sold along? Oh with yeah, the mask, like there were all kinds of anything like monster that? hands, skeleton hands. Uh, there was an octopus hand. It was like a tentacle. They had monster feet. Uh, they had kind of creature from the Black Lagoon type feet and hands. And uh, they had a plastic devil tail. Uh, they had a bunch of plastic, not plastic. They had a bunch of rubber hats that had molded onto the hat so, now if i'm not mistaken there wasn't there like a ball and chain yes. as well that they sold okay. I, I got a couple of those <laughs> i have a couple <laughs> um you know and he's not talking about his wife <laughs> no 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 definitely no no <laughs> she'll put one on me and it'll be real uh, I have uh, no, I have the ball and chain because I used to sell them in my store. So I do have maybe a couple left, like three or four. I do have an original vampire women woman, the vampire female yeah. from Topstone. Uh, I really don't know where it is. Does it have Does it have <laughs> black eyes or red eyes? The one that you've got. Black eyes, I think. Uh, you know what? I don't remember now. You now that you said that, it might be red. Eyes. I've got two with red eyes. I'd like to have one with black eyes. You know, it's like you just said, you just bought a, a name to me right now that I'm like, oh, my God, I haven't heard of Don in, in, in ages. In fact, the last time I talked to him might have been in the 90s, man. And uh, But I forgot exactly what I used to do with him. I know, I don't know if, uh, you know, I, I think I, I won't be surprised if originally he got one of the seven foot Frankensteins from me. Because, uh, you know, uh, Ray, like I told you the story, when I, Honor House was closing in 1985, I drove up there to, you know, to um, Limbrook, New York. And when I went to talk, and I was trying to talk to Edwin Wagman, the secretary said, uh, he can't, he said he wants you to write him a letter. And I'm like, really? Can I just see him a second? He said, no, write me a letter. And and what happened is um, with the writing the letter, I, I went to the, as I was driving back, one of the managers from the warehouse that was still there, Spanish guy, I asked him, you know, what happened to it? And he says, man, about a month ago, they came with a truck and we dumped everything in the dumpster. So he said, let me see what they can find. So he went into the warehouse and I waited outside for about 20, 30 minutes. And he came back with two envelopes. One of them had about 12 uh, skeletons and 11 Frankensteins. Wow. And uh, what, of course, I screwed up by, I think half of the people out there that have them is because I sold it to them. Because then LB from Texas, the guy that used to sell the wooden nickels that you see those ads in comic books mm -hmm. with a little B next to it said, LB, I took those and, and you know, he sent me an additional two Frankensteins. Uh, he gave them to me for like 20 bucks each. And again, I sold them for like $150, $200 a piece. And I know one guy sold one of the ones I sold them to another guy, and then the guy sold it for about five hundred dollars. Wow, it's kind of crazy, but um, that's that's my story there. <laughs> <laughs> now you're trying to find them all that stuff again, probably. It's like any time a collector sells stuff, it's like years down the road, they, they're like, man. Now well, you I know, I told you about the guy again. who found all the masters for Topstone. 
he didn't keep most of those. He sold almost all of those. And yeah, he's also since then been trying to buy back as many as he could over time. So that, you know, that's a pretty common thing. People f- make these fines and they don't keep them. They, they, they sell them. I guess the, even I have found things over the years and that looking back, Oh, I should have kept those. Um, but, but I, you know, I did, I like the, in the nineties, I bought all kinds of knockoff action figures, like, um, you know, eight, like rack toy, 1980s action figure lines for like a buck or two, three bucks each. And I would just have dozens of them. And now they're going for like 500, seven, eight hundred dollars each. But, you know, I sold them all off. So that happens. That happens a lot. We, you yeah. don't know what you've got at the time. I, I know the feeling when I about 15 years ago, when I got out of the army, I I didn't have a job or anything. So I needed to make some, mm-hmm. you know, some money and all that. And I sold a lot of my my horror toys and I, I had the entire line that Sideshow put out of the 12 inch uh, Universal Monsters figures and, and their regular monster figures and I had sold them all I think for just a little bit over you know what I had originally bought them for which I think they were like 30 bucks at the time and I think I sold them each for like 40 and now you know you can't find them on their $100 and I'm slowly trying to you know, find those and, and buy them back. I, I was lucky enough, it was about two years ago, I was able to find um, the Frankenstein monster from the first movie and then the Frankenstein monster from uh, House of Frankenstein. But, you know, just trying to find those. They, now they're going upwards of two, $300 a piece. So, you know, I think that's a, a huge bane of, of some collectors, man. You know, you sell stuff and then 10, 15, 20 years down the road, you're trying yeah. to regain them. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny because I'm listening here and I, I hear um, some of the background there noise. I, I think it's coming from you, Ray, but it's kind of funny because it reminded me of the mo- the record from the Gale House, the mail order record, The Haunting. Yeah. There's a part there that, it, <laughs> that you hear where it goes. <laughs> that out uh, there. <laughs> yeah, you know what I've. Re- when I was going to, to look for some music to play for the theme, I was going through some of my, my records because I was going to play a record. You know, I, I just used my phone for it, but I was going to play a record and it was just so like scratchy and, and you know, background noisy. I'm like, oh, this ain't going to well, sound too good. Well, you, you... So I, I found some on, on YouTube that were kind of cleaned up and I was able to. Uh, to well, you know it. what it is? As long as you're using like the iPhone or we're doing the podcast without the professional mics, it's going to pick up all the, the, the sounds around. The difference between the dynamic mic is a dynamic mic only p- picks up the sound in front of you, uh, not to the sides that much. And, and that's what prevents it. But it's kind of funny, though. I did appreciate the sound. And I'll tell you why, because it sounded just like that. If you guys hear the haunting, you'll hear somebody, you know, it says, and now I am the banshee or something like that. And then you hear the guy goes like, shh, 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 you know, drag, supposed oh, to be yeah, dragging his yeah. feet. It came out just perfect. <laughs> well, what was that on the last the last podcast? We had the the robot sounds in the background. Oh my god! We... <laughs> so it sounded it sounded like there was four of us plus a robot. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's like this happens because you're using the internet, and it's it's like I said, the coronavirus has made it very hard and and finally now that i got my equipment let's find out for the future you know it's going to be a lot better now um what i was saying though uh ray ray with the uh what would you say in price value though the shock monster or the teen wolf which do you think would demand a bigger price oh the shock monster you think the shock monster will do the teen wolf interesting now um, I remember, I think it was you who told me the story that the guy, one guy got it, he paid $200 for a bunch of masks from some collector on eBay, and in the background there was the shock monster among them, <laughs> and he knew he had a gold mine. That's kind of like the guy who bought the Frankenstein bucket. That's uh, And this is funny, I work in Hoboken, New Jersey, right next to where the Clinton uh, company was, the one that mm-hmm. made the bucket from the 60s that goes for like a thousand yep. bucks. And I, you have no idea how many people have called me and said, hey, can you go there? I said, there's nothing there, man. They build condominiums. You're not going to find an old warehouse filled with those buckets. It just doesn't exist. Nah. Uh, what bucket is that? Was that the no, popcorn no, bucket? No, it's plastic, orange plastic 
blow mold bucket. Oh, I don't think I've seen that. Was yeah, that like, it's was that Glenn Strange's Frankenstein face. It's made of orange blow molded plastic. Uh, looks very, and it's a very serious looking sculpt. It's not a cartoony sculpt. Well, you need to. I think somebody on Universal Monster Army posted oh, there's a, a, a whole few thread. months ago. There, might be... Okay, yeah, because I think there was an eBay link to somebody selling yeah, anytime, one. Yeah, for everyone, some crazy. Yeah, it's a very sought-after piece. A lot of people want that. I mean, it's not really that hard to find, but it does sell between, you know, like on the low side, 500, on the high side, 1,000 in that range. To, yeah, I, th- I think if I remember correctly, this one was just a, a little bit over I guess, a thousand. Uh, yeah, you know, for the bids I guess if and, it had yeah. um, the strap and perfect paint and nothing wrong, I could see it going. And with the right people bidding, I could see it going maybe twelve-ish, maybe. I I don't know. I mean, I haven't been looking at the prices lately, but if it's got like the bales missing, paint's all worn off, it's dented or got a hole in it or something, then it's probably like five hundred. You, 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 you want, you want them guys, I'm going to tell you a story is going to make you laugh. When I was, uh, I don't know, seven or eight, um, I got one. I got one actually in a, in a store it was, uh, it was called Wath Worth, not Woolworth or, or Wilco. It's W-A-D-S-W-O-R-T-H. I think it was located in 172nd Street in New York City in St. Nicholas Avenue. And they used to sell. A lot of those rubber, it was a five and dime. It was one of the early five and dimes. And I bought that bucket there for, I think it was like 50, 60 cents. I don't remember. And I had that bucket. And it was kind of funny because it had the Frankenstein head. I wanted it, right? So what I did with it is one day I, I took a pair of old pants that my grandfather had and a shirt. And I stuffed it with, I guess, newspapers. I forgot what the heck I used. And I put the bucket as a head. And I, I put it in my bed and I covered it with the shoes out. You know, it looked like there was somebody sleeping to trick my grandmother. But I'm just trying to say the bucket was fantastic. I used to play with it. Uh, but you know what? I have no idea what happened to it. Like, I, I don't know if my mom threw it out. Time faded. This is 1973 or 74. Because uh, I remember I was looking through a Boy's Life magazine at that year. And, you know, I was fascinated by, and I wanted the, you can float on air ad that showed you that you can buy, you know, hovercraft and build it to fly or float in air. And that was the year I had the bucket. I used to fill the bucket with, and here's something, uh, Ray, that you're going to remember too, because Ray was trying to help me design one of the original jigglers uh, from China. And uh, Ray, I, I never really contacted you based on that. Because when I sent out to China, the situation is that the fact that it was different colors, uh, they're not made anymore. And in fact, because of lead poisoning or something in the colors. Mm -hmm. So we didn't continue with it. That's why it never got anywhere. But I had the prisoner of Castle Mare. I think it was like, you know, it was like one of those jigglers. And I had the Frankenstein one. And I used to put him inside the bucket. With uh, not that I had Lee Lee Erickson, the Viking, I think it was like a G.I. Joe set. And I used to keep in the bucket all my uh, little parts for that particular G.I. Joe. And, uh, you know, that's that's what I can tell you about that bucket. Who, who knew it was going to be worth so much? Just like one thing that I'll tell you that maybe if you guys haven't looked at, there used to be a bazooka and it was called Agent Zero. And the bazooka was about, I don't know, 22 inches long heavy plastic and you would pump it 10 times and then when you pull the trigger it would it would have a loud boom the toy itself was not sold because i think there was a recall on it because i think it would actually launch things that can hurt people but i had one today i seen one on ebay going for like two thousand dollars and i'm like oh my god that's something Oh yeah, the, the Sonic Blaster. That was like around sixty four. No, I don't 65, think it was called the Sonic I, Blaster. I that... It was called the Agent Zero Bazooka or something like that. I yeah, Agent. Well, Zero I had Sonic one, Blaster. and it, let me tell you, that was a marvelous toy. The only thing that happened though, the handle to pump broke, and I would have a screwdriver stuck where it broke so that I could pump it. But that sucker <laughs> was loud, man. And that's another thing that you know it went with time. 
And I got to tell you something, though. Before 1995, my collection was really more. I had, I think, about 12 or 13 Aurora Monsters. Mm -hmm. The day before the fire, I went with my friend, and he was helping me because I had a 6x6 six six storage and two 5x9s. And I was moving everything from the 6x6 six six on the second floor, I mean, third floor, down to the second floor. And for some reason, we were talking about Aurora Monsters. And his favorite was the the... What do you call it? The um, King Kong. Mm -hmm. So I, I I I took out the Dracula, the Frankenstein. I took about eight of them out, which was six. Uh, I mean, four original Auroras, which was Frankenstein, Dracula, the Prisoner, and the Hunchback of Notre Dame. And I took out with that um, three of the Ravel. I don't know if it was Ravel monogram that made the the Pirates of the Caribbean. And the Haunted Mansion version that had the sap action. That they're actually remaking them today again with different names, of course. And I bought those out. And believe it or not, that same night, we were supposed to go the next day. And he, and he calls me up and he says, you won't believe this. Your place is on fire. I thought he was joking. I said, nah, you're kidding me. Man, I actually did cry that day. Because when I go up there, man, I, I don't know if there's an existing photograph of it. But the place was a five alarm fire. And then everything from there was sad. And that's why I say Jesus somehow wanted me to, God, I go, God, thank you for letting me protect a portion of them because all the stuff that was important to me, like the seven foot goals, the seven foot Frankensteins I had and all that survived. And the way they survived was that in the first floor, I had a bin that was about 22 feet up in the air. And it was a five by five bin that used to cost me $20 a month. And in there, I had the majority of my mail order stuff. And you would have to climb a ladder to go. Now, the good thing about it, since it was a steel bin, all the water that fell, fell around it, and nothing inside that thing, because this was an alarm, a five alarm fire that the entire third floor of the place disintegrated. In fact, I used to have a copier that was one of those old library copiers that used the thermal paper. And it took my three brother-in-laws and myself to take it over. That's how heavy that copier was. And this was a desktop one. And that thing disintegrated completely. Like the steel roll in there, there was, you couldn't even see any, le anything left from it, from the fire. In the second floor, I had a filing cabinet. In fact, I had three filing cabinets. Everything inside the filing cabinet survived. I had a wooden cedar chest, like the old-fashioned uh, uh, locker chest that you put in the bottom of your bed back in the 50s. And that meant everything. That, that thing turned like the freaking Noah's Ark. The, the, it got destroyed. The water fell on that thing and it just warped, man. Mm -hmm. That's why I said never put anything on wood. But everything inside the filing cabin is the Johnson Smith catalogs. All that stuff survived. I did have about, which I told the story in, a, in, a, in one of the last podcasts, I had about 30 or 20, 25, 30 Johnson Smith catalogs in one of those filing cabinets, along with the original six-foot uh, poster of, of, of uh, King Kong that was sold in Famous Monsters back in the day. That this is he's overlooking the city, Joe, the one that you just recently purchased. And that poster, oh, yeah. one of the people there took the opportunity and they stole them on me. They took all 30, everything I had in the drawer, they took ah. out. And it took me years for me to recuperate that poster. And every time I see the person in flea markets and stuff, I go up to see and I said, man, if I ever find them selling any of my stuff, it's going to prove they stole it on me. It just gets me, it pees me off the fact that they took it on me, you know? But um, anyway, after that, I started recuperating most of my collection and buying and buying. And right now, I really don't know what I have. I have uh, the area I'm in here, the storage facility or the where I have my office is 38 feet by 36 feet. It's about six feet, four inches high. And it's and that's the one that I show right there when you go into houseoftheunusual.com, the tour. But I still have a 10 by 12 foot storage that's up to the door. You can't you can't get in. And I also have a six by four foot closet. I mean, four by four foot closet in my house packed to the door. I also have under my. You need to open up. You need to open up like well, a museum out there, man. You know what? There, I should. But here, here's one question I want to ask you, uh, Ray. In in mail order mysteries, the mask you have there, are those your originals or are they, you know, samples? Uh, pretty much all the ones in that book are mine. There's a, there's a lagoon monster that's mine now. 
But at the time I took that picture, it, it was with the previous owner, but we were in the process of making a deal. So it wasn't official mine yet, but we were, you know, negotiating on it. And a few months later, I, I owned it. So I own it now. What, what, what would you... What would you say when you say Lagoon? You know how that's an expensive mask, right? That's not no, 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 right? no. I'm talking about the Topstone mask. Okay, the top. Yeah, that's right. Topstone. I'm sorry. Do you, check this out. About four years ago, okay, I'm stand, sitting in a sports bar with my best friend, and we're looking, you know, we're talking and stuff, and we're looking through eBay. And lo and behold, somebody lists a creature from the Black Lagoon mask from uh -huh. Topstone. If I tell you this, you won't believe it. For $22. What? Dude, I bought it. I bought it <laughs> for 22 I gave it to my friend. He, you know, he's my best friend. So, I, you know, he he's a big creature. I mean, I can send you pictures of the damn thing. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised. I think I might even yeah, have send it me a picture of it. Your friend. I, your, dude, your, I got it for 22 your bucks. Might want to. <laughs> uh, he will not sell any. No, no, he, he won't sell anything. Um, he. He. Let's put it this way. His trade is a pharmacist. He's director of pharmacy. He's got all yeah. the money in the world. No kids. He buys things. He's got a couple of, photo, of uh, autographs of... Um, he has about two autographs of uh, Neil Armstrong, which, you know, that goes for about 10 grand. Has one of uh, this uh, Bruce Lee, a check signed by Bruce Lee. You know, because I bought together with him. We would go... In fact, he's the one that got me to go to Chiller every year for the last 10 years where I met every movie star, I think we we're going twice. We only didn't go this year because of the coronavirus, you know, but we, I've never missed the chiller for the last 10, 15 years. Yep. Right. And I got to tell you, we spent or he bought for me or whatever, thousands of dollars in collectibles. I got the, you know, um, Leonard Nimoy, William Chagnus autograph. I got the autograph of many Elvira to have a, This guy did a model kit of Elvira that's about 12 inches, fully airbrushed, professional. And guess what? Gay guy, I, I, I kept haggling him, man. He had it for $140, gave it to me for $60, $65. And then I had Elvira signed it, which, you know, she didn't charge me anything because I've, I've been with her so many times that she uh, she's pretty good. I mean, I buy one or two autographs and she'll sign three things, you know. And let me tell you something. I have it packed. I never even took it out there. She has one of the most beautiful signatures I've ever seen. And um, so I do have, but that creature, um, you know, he, he deserves it. I'm not a mask collector. It would make no sense for me to start adding masks so, so to my collection. This creature that you got, does it have hair? Um, the creature from the Black Lagoon. The, the, the top stone that you found. Does it have hair? Yeah. That's a good damn question. Okay, I don't know. so I've got two Topstone Lagoon monsters. They've both been foamed. So foaming is a process uh, to preserve the mask. You, you fill it with expanding foam and you mount it to a base. And if it's done professionally, it it's, looks very nice. So I've got two of those, the original Keith Ward Lagoon monster foamed. And they're from two different years. One's like 60s and the other looks like it's probably 70s. But the same sculpt. But neither of them have hair, and a friend of mine named Rudy has one with hair. They did, they may, they, they did put the mask out with hair. They had it. That, they put it out with red hair, and yeah, red. That is odd. That's what I'm saying. I never heard that. And a big, and the one Rudy has is a combination of red hair and blue hair, and, and the blue hair is the same hair that was on the blue-haired shock monster. So it's the same color blue. Um, and also I've got, a I've got two plastics because Topstone also made plastic masks based on the same characters. I've got two plastic shock monsters, same sculpt, same everything, except it's made of plastic instead of rubber. And one of my shock monsters has red hair, just like that lagoon monster. And the other has, does not have hair, never had hair. You know, you, you're making me think on that because I don't remember now if it does. Here's, here's what basically happened. When we got it, we never really even opened the box. Um, I think, you know what, to be honest with you, as I, the more I'm talking about it, I think here's what I have. I, I can tell you this. I bought from Elusive Concepts, uh -huh. okay, because I have wholesale accounts with them due to the fact that I have now, my By the way, account. before you go any further, what? Elusive Concepts started as a division of Topstone. 
then it broke away into its own company. That, you know what, to be honest with you, I don't remember. I, I can't really. But now that you say it sounds like, yeah, uh, just like the name you said before that you're bringing back memories to me that I even forgot about. But I got to tell you something. They put out a Glenn Strange edition of Frankenstein mask over the head completely. Uh -huh. And the whole the wholesale price was seventy nine dollars. I bought it. Um, I have that. And then I sold it. <laughs> I sold it for one hundred and eighty bucks. And it sounds stupid as it is. The person that bought it was a female and she actually wore it. So I'm like, why would you wear a collector's mask? But this was the wholesale price. And then I bought from, because um, see, I'm, I'm kind of friends with the guy who owns Morris Costumes. Now, if you're familiar with Scott Morris, I mean, Scott, Scott is the son. He's the one running it. But Philip Morris is that famous yeah. magician that used to do spook shows. And he did, yeah. you know, the Haunted House. He, he passed uh, away, right? He passed away recently. In fact, here's a sad thing. When, and you know, kind of the story of, of the mail order mysteries and everything, I, I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say on radio, but there was an opportunity that I was going to get, there was a, a company called the Epstein, Michael Epstein from the Epstein Foundation. He's the guy kind of started Kickstarter and they were going to film a movie based, they wanted me to help co-produce concerning the fact of uh, mail order and sea monkeys and melon, you know, animals yeah, they got, from the seven yeah, that, 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 that sea monkey guy is a weirdo. I mean, <laughs> I, mean that, it, it, I can imagine a movie about him. He was, <laughs> he was a character. He's, he's a pretty dark character. Yeah, I, I know him. I, I know Harold was interesting. Uh, you know what? It's you have no idea. I mean, if you meet him in person, he you you'll understand he was not a bad guy i i gotta be honest he was always very friendly to me i, I could never say anything bad about him but i do know I, i know what you're talking about i'm not gonna get in details what i know but i can tell you this much though um the the movie i was gonna do with based on that or with these people uh they were i was gonna set up the guy now if you guys are aware craig talbeck was the guy who basically did all the marketing for johnson smith between mm -hmm. 69 through And Craig was going to go and meet up with me because he, the thing is that Craig is related to Philip Morris or his wife is related to Philip Morris somehow, you know, they, they, they know each other and, and he's been there. So he was going to make an arrangement for me to go to meet up with Philip Morris, meet him. They were going to come and, and at the same time I was going to have Dave Harvest sat from SS Adams go down there with me. So it was going to be a nice filming, but then I'm like, wait a minute, why the heck am I going to allow somebody to film something that I'm not going to own the bitch for, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just kind of got turned off and, and you know, the stories that have happened and, and, you know, without getting into too much details, that's why I just basically, um, I did not pursue it, but uh, then he passed away because I wanted to do, because, you know, supposedly he started the Bigfoot legend. Well, uh, okay. So yeah, so Philip Morris is someone I'd always wanted to meet. It's a shame he's gone. I, I won't have that opportunity. I would have loved to have toured his factory and met him and talked to him. So I know all about how he claims that the Roger Patterson, Bob Gibbon Bigfoot costume was one that they bought from him. But we all know that Philip Morris was a, a showman and he's, you know, he's, he likes Ballyhoo. So I think we got to take that with a grain of salt. Um, that that costume was in fact from Philip Morris. because I've, you know, I've read quite a bit and talked to a lot of people about, the Roger Patterson situation. And I, I, at this point in my life, I don't think it was a real creature, but I, I don't, I also don't think it came from Philip Morris. Uh, I think that was a bit of ballyhoo on Mr. Morris's part. I, uh... see, I, I think that, that, you know, going back to that whole, You know that that footage. I, I that's one of those things I don't think is ever going to be, you know, solved. You know, Ooh. was it a real creature? Was it a costume? Where did the costume come from? Because you you hear both sides of the argument, and there's you know both sides yeah, make for, compelling for years, arguments. For years, I for, thought yeah, for I, years and years, I thought things, it was real. It I always look at it as, that's a real creature. I mean, it's right? Like, they they couldn't make anything that good back then. Come on, because they just had this the smack of reality about it. But in more recent years, um, where we have much, we have high definition 
transfers now of that film. We can look at it in much more detail. We've got stabilized versions. It's, it, looking at it now is a different experience than looking at it 20, 30, 40 years ago. So looking at it today, I could say, oh, you know, seam there and a seam there. And I see where this part of the costume joins with this part of the costume. And I see a little fold where he steps down. Every time he steps down, you see the kind of fabric caving in around his ankle. So on and so on and so on. There's all these little tells that I couldn't see 20, 30 years ago, but I can see now with the stabilized high definition versions of that film. So now it looks much less realistic to my eyes today than it did a generation ago. So that's why I'm, I'm more skeptical about it now. Where is it? Well, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, if you'd asked me, let's say in the 1990s, I would have said, oh, yeah, I think it's real. <laughs> and not because not I was like a true believer or anything <laughs> like that, just, just objectively, you know, just using logic, I would look at it and say, look at this footage. That's a real thing. Because you, well, because you couldn't, you right. couldn't tell now, otherwise based on no, the, what was available at the time. It looked like a living creature. And, uh, and there, there wasn't anything like that in the 60s. If you look at, professional Hollywood movies and TV shows, there was nothing like that. No, no one was making suits like that uh, that were that convincing at the time. The only thing you could point to maybe was 2001 A Space Odyssey. And that's the very, very, very top of the line. You know, the most cutting edge professional ape suits that were made at that time. And, 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 and who, how, how could these right. two guys in the woods get access to something like that? Well, I was at now, now before we before we get too far off on a tangent because we're coming down to the uh, the end here. We got about ten minutes, and uh, we're gonna let's let's finish off our Halloween special with a little uh, nostalgic trip. So, I'd like to hear your guys, you know, maybe your your most fondest or your your favorite Halloween memory from from when you were a kid. And uh, Eddie, we'll we'll let you start this one off. What is your your most fondest you know memory going way 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 wow. way? Because you know we know how old you are. Way 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 back. My fondest you know? memory was 1973. <laughs> I went to this guy who was a friend of mine, and we went. He had a Halloween party, so he was a super. And since I lived in Manhattan, all the buildings over there have fallout shelters in the basement, and that's where the super's apartment is. So we went, and because the basement is kind of like pretty long and scary and dark, you know, we we had it. It was a very memorable Halloween party, and um, it, it it you know I still have it in my mind because believe it or not, it was one of like the first and the last I ever went to. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and this was in 1973, so I really <laughs> really enjoyed it. I used to love because with five dollars I would go to that store Woolworth or Wokel and not Wokel Wokel was never really around uh, New York it was more like in other parts but you go to Woolworth or you would go to that West it was like I said W Watts worth I think it was and I would buy the imaginary vampire blood for like 60 cents or less I would buy a costume for like 320 350 and my favorite boy I always usually used to buy the Superman one <laughs> or the Batman and, um, you know, nice. I'll tell you why I thought it was the greatest Halloween, too, because not only was that party awesome, but my aunt, um, which is one of my, you know, my close one of my aunt, one of my favorite aunts, she gave me and it was that particular year, the year before she before this party that I went to, she gave me a Superman costume. And when I was. I came from Cuba in 1968, whatever. I used to watch the Superman with George Reeves. Uh, and I used to watch it like I used to. That was my favorite show. And when she gave me that Superman costume that I saw the S on the thing, man, the, that was a Ben Cooper, by the way. But not the Ben Cooper, the older one. This is more like the plastic version that had no shorts on it. And I treasured that costume so bad, man, that I actually had to buy myself one. And I still have it today in perfect condition uh, <laughs> because it was my favorite Christmas gift ever. And that I, I got to wear it that time to go to that party. So I was pretty proud of my no shorts Superman 
goofy looking Halloween costume with no S in the cape either. You know that I always wonder. Oh, there, there is one. I actually have one. Somewhere. If you look There's at Mail Order Mysteries, <laughs> I'm wearing one right there. That's it. You know what I'm saying? Nice. So, Ray, what's your Ray? What's your uh, yeah? They your, kind your of blends together. I can from just Halloween past. Reach into this goopy pool of my memory and, and pull out a few, like pulling some slimy fish out of a pond or something. But one I one that comes to mind. I don't. I couldn't even tell you what year it is. It, all this would be the seventies, maybe early eighties. Uh, I went to. I was trick or treating, and there was a local house. It was on the street behind uh, the street where I lived. And I'd never really been into inside a homemade haunted house before. So I went there trick or treating with my parents. Uh, I don't know if it was my mom or my dad, but one of them was with me. Rang the doorbell, trick or treat, and they said, Come on in. And inside, they had set up a haunted house where you had to tour all through their house. To, yeah, so, and they had these pretty good rooms. You went wow. from one room to the next. It was all very moody, dark lighting, and strobe lights and smoke and everything inside the house they're all dressed up and they had little scenes and every every uh, every room of the house had like a little scene and at that age it really scared me and then the i couldn't tell you all the different rooms but the last one they had a real coffin it, it was like their living room but they was all cleared out so it looked like a mortuary or something and there was a real coffin and then right and and, and when you enter the room, slowly the coffin lid opened, and this guy, like zombie makeup and a tuxedo, slowly rose up out of the coffin, and all this was with a strobe effect. And he was saying something. His, his, I remember his name was Igor, uh, and I, I, I freaked out. I just screamed and ran out of the house. <laughs> and, and, and they were all laughing. I, I, whichever parent I remember, remember from my mom or my dad, but they were at the door laughing, and then they come back, come back, come back. I was not, I didn't even want the candy. I said, just keep the candy, forget it. And, and <laughs> that, that scared me to death. Um, <laughs> other memories, I, I enjoyed Imagineering makeup kits a lot. I, I, I had, oh, I had both of them. So they, they had something called the face, which is in a box, and it's like foam rubber pieces. But they also had more primitive uh, kits. They had a mummy and a werewolf kit and both of them were primarily just cotton balls and you take this, this tube of goop uh, it was, I think one had green goop and the other might have been reddish brown goop for the werewolf and you just soaked the cotton balls in the goop and applied it to your face and it stuck in it dry to make like, like a lumpy cotton ball face and, and then they had like fake teeth and eyeballs and things nice. to make yourself either look like a mummy or a werewolf I mean you didn't really look like either one you looked like a kid with goopy cotton balls on your face but I remember I, I had both those kits, and I remember <laughs> uh, making myself up as the mummy and a werewolf, and just I really enjoyed the process of working with the cotton balls and the tube of junk. I re always really liked Imagineering, and later I had their foam face kits. It was called The Face, and they had like an ape face and a Frankenstein, a skull, and devil, and so on. And I had several of those. I must have had, I must have bought two or three per Halloween because I had so many. It, it couldn't be that I had one. Because, see, my parents, thank goodness, they were generous about Halloween. It was like buying toys for Christmas. They didn't just buy me one costume for Halloween. They would buy a multitude of things as if they were buying toys. Because I didn't just wear it one time Halloween. It was like my, my play things for the month of October were these Halloween, the Halloween stuff. So I would have multiple Imagineering kits. Nice. And I would have multiple Topstone masks. I would have a Ben Cooper costume. I'd have all this stuff and I would just play with it all month long into, into November. So, and then there'd be like the school right. would have their Halloween party and their Halloween parade. So I'd have one outfit for that. And then there might be some other function or activity that I'd have an outfit for that. And then there'd be actual trick or treating itself that, that the night of Halloween. So I have another outfit for that. So I'd have multiple outfits and probably the fanciest one would be the trick-or-treating one but i might have like imagineering for one and a top stone for another and a ben cooper for another <laughs> so i spread it out oh and, and then i also remember the close encounters of a third kind imagineering kit um where it was another foam rubber thing but it was a mask and you taped it together you you, you had a little piece of the tape and stuck this mask together 
and I was, um, I don't know if, yeah, I did, I was, I, my mother made me like a costume, kind of like pajamas, but it was supposed to be that alien from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, so I wore the Imagineering mask that was like a do-it-yourself mask that you put together with these sort of beige pajamas that my mother sewed together. And then I had some kind of uh, gloves that had big, long fingers, like E.T. fingers, but this was before E.T., this was Close Encounters, but they, and so she actually made these gloves with, like, big, long fingers, <laughs> and, and so I was that Close Encounters alien. Nice. Mm-hmm. Hey, well, good, good deal. That, that Some good memories. And we're we're yeah, wrapping it up here at the, at the bottom, um, so I'll just, I'll just finish off with, with my memory. My I'll make it real quick. My fondest Halloween memory was eating as much candy as I could until I couldn't move oh off of the gosh. floor in my pile of candy. So, guys, thanks for, for stopping in tonight. Uh, everybody out there, thanks for listening. Uh, remember, you could find us on Anchor, uh, Apple Podcasts, House of the Unusual Radio, all one word. Uh, find us on YouTube at House of the Unusual. Also, head on over to Instagram. You could find us under House of the Unusual on there and also Crypt of Classics. And don't forget to go to houseoftheunusual.com. We have a forum there. It's free to join. You could, uh, you know, put your different topics in. You could uh, give us topics for future shows, you know, what you want to hear, and you can meet some like-minded people. Thank you. So, again, Ray, thanks for joining us. And thanks for being on. And good night, guys, and happy holidays.